you can't post things with the nudity on the Teen Wolf Tumblr. <laughs> Man, do you even know what it was like back in the Tumblr Wars? Like, we, 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 I've seen some shit. <laughs> and no, no shade against Colton Haynes' jawline. It's glass, it's amazing. But... Just being able to find so much joy in Teen Wolf. Welcome to Return to Beacon Hills, a Teen Wolf rewatch podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Will Wallace, and I'm joined by... Kate Colvin. And Calissa Mullis. Every week we'll be watching and talking about the hit MTV series one episode at a time. And this week we're talking about season one, episode 11, Formality. And for this episode, we're joined by a special guest, Ashby Brame. Hello, Ashby. Hello. Thanks for having me. So I co-host the What the What podcast and we cover pop culture and we normally do that through a lens of being an 80s, 90s baby, which we all are. And yep. I'm really excited to join you guys this week to talk about Teen Wolf, which is one of my favorite pop culture things. And if anyone's interested in listening to the What the What podcast, you can follow us on WTW underscore media on Twitter or at What the What Media, all one word on Instagram. So thanks for having me. Fantastic. This is our pleasure. If you're watching Teen Wolf for the first time and you're worried about spoilers, have no fear. This podcast is broken up into two sections, alpha and beta. The beta section is for first timers who are just now finding this awesome series and don't wanna be spoiled about what's to come. The second section, alpha, is where we go full spoilers and talk about not just the current episode, but the entire Teen Wolf series, as well as its place in the fandom. In the show notes of your podcast app of choice, you'll find time codes for the alpha and beta sections. If you'd like to support the show, you can find us on Patreon at RTBH Podcast. There, our Wolfie patrons will gain access to awesome exclusives, like early access to episodes, full moon AMAs, the Beacon Hills Movie Club, where we watch and provide commentary for movies starring the amazing cast of Teen Wolf and featuring the work of our talented crew, as well as guest video interviews and a monthly watch party. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash RTBH podcast and join the pack. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at RTBH podcast and Tumblr and TikTok at Return to Beacon Hills. If you'd like to ask us questions or offer suggestions for future topics to discuss, you can email us at return to Beacon Hills at gmail.com. Ashby, would you like to tell us how you came to be a Teen Wolf fan? Well, I was thinking about it and I feel like do you ever just show up into fandoms and you're not sure how you got there? Like being born. Like, you know, you're alive, but you don't remember being born. <laughs> so you don't remember being reborn as a Teen Wolf fan then? Correct. Correct. <laughs> I know at some point in grad school, I think that I started watching it on maybe the earliest version of like Netflix streaming. Like when Netflix moved from a DVD mail-in model, like for college. And yes, for the, you young listeners out there, you used to get Netflix in the mail. <laughs> and then they started streaming and they would put, or maybe I was watching like MTV online or something. It, it, I just remember that Teen Wolf was the show that I, was sort of in front of me to watch and I was like, oh, I'll try this. I have some downtime. And I caught up with it enough that at some point, my only option was watching it in real time on MTV. And MTV was not part of the basic cable package for everywhere I was moving at the time. So I do remember (laughs) at one point that I was so into it that I would go work out at my apartment gym just because they had a premium cable package and I could watch Teen Wolf while I walked on the treadmill. Uh, I so love that, your commitment to sparkle motion there. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. hope they turned into angry workouts, like the, the angry workout energy that Teen Wolf has. Everybody's well, always doing mean push-ups and stuff. I did often feel pressured into running, watching the wolves do stuff. Cause I was like, I'm clearly yeah. very out of shape. Like they're doing parkour and I'm just walking (laughs) on the treadmill. So then I would kind of like jog, but yeah, I just remember sort of being like fully immersed in it at some point. And that eventually led to me being in fandom, like on Tumblr and into fan fiction and following along when they went to Comic-Con and things like that. And so just at some point I was just like in it. And I remember watching the series finale live. And then last year in 2020, when I was working from home and I was not leaving my house, I remember thinking like, I should watch 
a series that I've seen before, but have never gone back and watched all the way through once every episode was available to me. And so Teen Wolf was one of the first shows I did that for last year. And it was amazing to be able to see it all the way through without stopping. And I practically did not stop. (laughs) I just (laughs) watched it straight through. And it was really fun to see the series grow and mature that quickly instead of watching it like very slowly happen from year to year like I had as a viewer. That's how I got into Teen Wolf. (laughs) And for people listening, you can't see, but she has a photo with Tyler Hecklin up on a shelf behind her. So you've been to some fan conventions where you've met the cast? Yes. So I'm out of North Carolina and I'm really close to Raleigh and they have sort of like a wizard con or, you know, the comic cons that travel around basically come in once a year and they have a bunch of different people from a bunch of different movies and TV shows. And a few years ago, Tyler Hecklin was one of the guests. And so I got a photo op and one of the funniest things that's ever happened to me at a convention is I'm not a cosplayer and that's not for lack of like want, it's just, it takes like hats off to cosplayers because it takes a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of energy and a lot of passion. And I rarely have all of those things at once. Um, (laughs) So I just wanted to look nice for the photo op. So I had, at the time I had long sort of like brown blonde hair that had a reddish tint to it because my hair's always had a reddish tint to it and I had straightened it so that it was like nice and silky and long and I wore this really cute like black wrap bodycon dress that was kind of short and then I had on these like cute leather boots and I was standing in line to get this photo op taken and I get this tap on my shoulder and I turn around and there's a girl who's also in line for the Tyler Hecklin photo op like a few people back And she goes, um, excuse me, but are you cosplaying as Lydia Martin? (laughs) And I was like, yes, thanks for noticing. (laughs) And she said, can I take a picture with you? (gasps) Oh, that's wonderful. And I was like, absolutely. Thank you for asking. (laughs) I love that you just embraced it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I was like, absolutely. If someone thinks that I look anything remotely like Holland Road and I will take it I'll take it (laughs) yeah that's so fun so that was one of the best things that came out of the picture op obviously aside from being able to be next to Tyler Hecklin for five seconds great five seconds I'm sure amazing five seconds (laughs) it was great it was great yeah this episode is episode 11 formality and it was written by Monica Maser and directed by Russell Mulcahy. With the spring formal approaching, Scott struggles to find a way to protect Allison from Peter. Kate tortures Derek to try to find out the identity of the other beta in Beacon Hills. After being banned from the dance, Scott makes Jackson take Allison and Lydia ends up attending with Styles. Soon, Scott's semi-normal life as a high schooler and his life as a supernatural creature come crashing into each other with the final confrontation just on the horizon. And we actually had several favorite quotes from this episode. Just, it's just such a great episode and I love the writing for it. So starting off, my favorite quote is Kate saying, sweetheart, there are werewolves running around in the world. Everything's a joke to me. How else do you think I stay sane? Joke's on you. You cray cray. (laughs) All the cray. Yes. And we have a a couple of honorable mentions here. And my favorite for this episode is from Allison when she's talking to Lydia. And she says to Lydia, oh, don't frown, Lydia. Someone could be falling in love with your smile. But in a very different tone than Will just said it. Yes. One of my picks for best quote in this episode is Coach Finstock saying, I told them I'd rather cut off my last remaining testicle than cut my best player. (laughs) I love Fantastic. Coach is I love him so much. One of my favorite quotes uh, out of this episode is from Jackson. Uh, We get some, what we in the fandom like to call subtext here. He says to Scott and Styles, screw you. You know what? Screw you too. In fact, screw each other. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. And then another one I'll throw in the ring is Styles saying, How about I'm always right and you should listen to whatever I have to say and never disagree ever, ever for the sake of your wolflyhood. Nice. Wolflyhood. I love it. I love a good portmanteau. The other one I really love from Styles in this episode is like an an ongoing sort of arc in season one about how much Styles hates Derek. (laughs) And so he says to Scott, could you at least think about letting him die for me? (laughs) 
So this episode opens with Allison driving home in the rain. She's distracted by the memories of Kate torturing Derek as she reveals the truth about what is happening in Beacon Hills. Sheriff Stilinski pulls her over for speeding and she has a breakdown as it all becomes too much for her. This is a really good scene. Allison kind of fascinates me in this episode because she's really upset and uncomfortable for all the wrong reasons, it, it feels like. I mean... I understand that Kate is her aunt and she has said earlier in the season, she's more like my sister in terms of her relationship to me than like my dad's sister. But I just, for me, I don't feel like there's anybody in the world that I trust so entirely that if they brought me into a room where they were electrocuting someone, I would just be like, all right, this is happening. Or I'm really upset because werewolves exist I'm not going to ask any follow-up questions on the electrocution angle. I feel Mm -hmm. like if one of the people that I trusted most in this world brought me into a room where they were electrocuting someone, even like a monster, I'd be like, I'm sorry, but this is a hold the up moment for me. (laughs) Hold the up. Yeah. I agree. I agree. (laughs) Yeah. That would be, I feel like that would be like one of your relatives, like shooting someone point blank in the head and being like, we're in the mob. And you would be like, we're in the mob. <laughs> right, right. You just yeah. shot someone. <laughs> You'd be like, I have so many follow-up questions. I, I, I don't even know how to start unpacking this. Right. And I know that it's a lot to process, but it, it does, it just feels like in this episode that the thing that has really thrown her is the existence of werewolves, understandable, but she's not super thrown by the, and therefore I have to electrocute them for information aspect of that revelation. And I feel like that aspect is also pretty ground shaking. (laughs) I feel like Allison also should have been like, and why is he shirtless, Aunt Kate? Like, is that part of the necessary torture? Like mm. the better to lick him. (laughs) My dear. <laughs> even even if Kate had said that, Allison would have been like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? She would have been yeah. like, no, it would have been more like, okay, okay, I guess. right? Allison, just crying. Yes, Allison gets very upset in this scene, and I mean, can you blame her? Really, can you blame her? She's this door has been opened, and the world is right. now a different place for her. The right. problem is, she's upset about all the wrong things. Right. Like it's like all the things happening in front of her face, she's not really upset about. And I feel like we need to be turning the upsetness into the right direction, namely at Kate and also the shirtless werewolf who's being electrocuted and everything. And I feel like, I just feel like you watch the scene and you get all these flashbacks as she's driving and it's just like, you're so upset, but it, it nothing that's really relevant. It's all the super relevant things you're not upset about. And we right. need to be fixing this right now. But instead, she's like, I just have to go drive fast. Really fast. Really Really fast. fast. Like 75 in a 25 in a construction zone. Thank God Sheriff Selinski was there to pull her over so she didn't hit anybody. Mm -hmm. But also, I kind of feel like Selinski was falling down on his job a little bit in this scene because clearly she's upset driving super fast in the wrong speed zone and in a construction zone. And she's like crying and super upset. But he's... I feel like they play this scene a little for comedy where he's, you know, he sees that she's upset. He's like, oh, oh, feelings and emotions. Uh, I'm, I'm a man. I don't <laughs> Please know don't this. cry. It makes me so uncomfortable. It, yeah, it right. makes me very uncomfortable. I'm, I'm not going to give you a ticket. You can go about your business. And it's like, no, no, stop this. So, something, clearly something is happening and you need to be like, we should take the keys out of the ignition and, and talk for a little while. You right. Know? Is there someone in your back seat putting a gun to your back? Like you, you seem suspiciously upset. Yes, this is right. Beacon Hills and there's a lot of murder. He has places to be. He cannot just stop and console every person he pulls over crying. There's probably a lot of them. I mean, that's fair. <laughs> Scott got injured in the previous episode and he wakes up at the animal clinic where Deaton shockingly has been helping him. And it seems like Deaton's a little bit in the know here because he wasn't like, oh, these things have happened to you. with this amazing healing ability. He's just like, hey, hey man, you Okay. Hey, little buddy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Deaton, but of course, as we, as has been previously established, Deaton is like dead calm all the time. So yeah. like, I'm not sure what it would take to actually rattle him. I'd love to know. It would be amazing because it, it would have to be like a Cthulhu monster 
or something, you know, like an ancient one or something. And instead he's just like, Hey man, I fixed you up. You're totally awesome. You should rest though. Totally rest. You're, you know, but before they even really have time to talk about it, there's a visitor at the animal clinic. And who was it? It was Peter is the answer to that rhetorical question. Peter looking super suave in his duster. And again, he's, he comes in and he's, he wants Scott and Deaton just ain't having it. And Peter threatens him and Deaton just completely calm, completely even heart rate, as far as we can tell. And he just doesn't give Peter the time of day. He's not going to give up Scott and Peter can't come in to the animal clinic. We discover like, apparently there's some kind of barrier. And he says it was mountain ash. Mountain Mountain ash. ash. Mountain ash. And this is our introduction to mountain ash. Very important part of the show as it goes on. Yep. Yes. It's a fantastic addition to the show, but apparently Mount Nash acts as some kind of barrier for supernatural creatures. And so the animal clinic is a safe haven for the time being. Peter just implies that since he can't cross over and get to Scott, he'll just go after Allison. He's also very dramatic. He just throws something at Dean's head, but misses. And Deaton does not flinch. Mm-mm. And it, he, he he's the calmest And he also, in this scene, illustrates one thing that I really like about several characters on Teen Wolf, which is that they can enunciate. As I said, we are closed. They're all badass. Yeah, love it. I love that actor. And I haven't had the chance to see him in other things. So he's really only ever been Deaton to me. And he's so good. He's He's so fantastic on The Wire. Okay. The series The Wire. He's fantastic on that. Good to know. So, um, is it Fear the Walking Dead that he's on now? Regular Fear the Walking, Walking Dead. dead. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hmm. There's Good so many of those Walking Deads now. <laughs> yeah, this scene is another example for me of like, when you move through the series, there are times where you will find yourself going like, bless Scott McCall's little heart because <laughs> he's got so much of that heart, but he can be pretty dumb sometimes. <laughs> and it's like, baby. Peter can clearly hear him. And so Peter says, I'm going to go after someone you care about. And then Scott says, Allison, like he can hear you. <laughs> like if- <laughs> that wasn't the person he was going after like way to play your hand you know and then also like on behalf of styles i'm a little offended that the first person he thought of was allison like i'm sorry i've just been your (laughs) best friend since we were like in kindergarten way to think of me bro you know not to mention melissa yeah his mom Right, or his dad, or I mean, yeah, or no Stiles, like, him. <laughs> sorry, I meant or Styles' dad, like oh, the okay, sheriff. Oh, yeah. yeah. I feel like there are people in Scott's circle when this show starts that like have been in his life forever, like Styles and his dad, and then Scott's mom, and immediately he's just like Allison. <laughs> So now that Scott thinks Allison might potentially be in danger, he's like, okay, now I need to call Derek. But he can't find his phone anywhere. And he knows he can't handle Peter alone. And while searching for his phone, he overhears Melissa on a call. She's just getting the voicemail, but she's trying to set up a possible date. And she's just having a hard time with the call. Yeah, it is heartbreaking. This scene was one that I don't even really remember, like it phasing me the first time I ever watched it. And then obviously it's been many years since then and many failed dates since then. And so (laughs) when I rewatched it last year, I cried. Like I legit, this scene made me cry. And I was like, why Why am I crying? (laughs) But I just really love like the, the intimacy of it first, because Melissa doesn't know that Scott can hear her crying. And I think, you know, as parents, I'm not a parent, but I'll say as parents, I feel like we really try to hide a lot of our, you know, weaker, sadder, angrier, upset moments from our children because we don't want them to see that. And so I think Melissa would be really embarrassed if she knew that Scott could hear her. And then also I like the vulnerability of this moment from Melissa's character arc perspective, because up until this moment, we have seen Melissa and we'll continue to see Melissa as, you know, this like badass woman who is like very confident in her job and her career, who's a very confident mother in raising Scott. And we get to see this one thing in her life that she's clearly not confident about. And I really, I really like this scene just for that like quiet moment. Yeah, it's a great moment. It's really good. It breaks my heart every single time. And I'm just sitting there like, why doesn't anyone see how great you are? Right. Oh my gosh. What is she? So unfair. That's a catch. She is no, she's such a catch. A catch. She's a complete 10. And it's just like, Stunning. I don't understand how she's not just like inundated with people trying her to date her. Her hair I is perfect. Her face is perfect. 
Her voice is perfect. Everything she says is perfect. Why doesn't right. anyone see how great she is? It's not right. fair. Yeah. Also, for anyone who has a competency kink, like this woman can do her job. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, do you want someone super beautiful? Melissa, are you like a sapiosexual and it's all about intelligence and competence? Oh, hit me, hit, yes. Still Melissa. You lo- still Melissa. It's, it's like whatever you were looking for, you got it. But with Melissa no longer a target, Peter has another trick up his sleeve to get Scott to reveal more information. When he makes the comment about, you know, hmm, who should I go after? And Scott's like, Allison. He's like, there it is. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> It's like, oh, oh, yes, no, that's who I totally meant. It's not... That's who I meant. That's definitely who I meant. Exactly. No yeah. awkward first dates. I'm going to go to Macy's. <laughs> okay, Peter is fantastically creepy and it's wonderful. And Ian Bowen, who plays him, plays him so fantastically creepy. So that when he is like talking with Allison at the Macy's, I just feel like I need to scream, someone, we need an adult right <laughs> over here, please. Because there's a man adult talking, on aisle four. Please. Adult on aisle four, please. You know, <laughs> stranger danger, stranger danger. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and, but but to Allison's credit, like I mean, because you you, know, you have scenes like this in other stories where the villain comes up and is super smarmy and and talking to someone who's not involved in like that part of the story, and the person who's not involved is just kind of like eating it up and all this. He's like, no, no, they're so close. It's the danger. But Allison is totally not buying it. Like I totally like in the scenes, she's just like, who are you? What? You know, yeah. can you tell by her, just her body language and the stuff she says that she's just like looking for the exits and trying to figure out how to get out of the situation. And she immediately says through him. Yeah. She's like, ew. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just a really sincere reaction of like what a teen girl would have if a grown man approached her and would say, oh, here, this dress would look better on you while shopping. I mean, I would want to run. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think what's interesting about that scene from the perspective of Allison's character is we get so much of her in the pilot and then in the car in the scene with Sheriff Stolinski. She has a very particular image of herself as someone who is not intimidated. A damsel in distress. Yeah. Yes. She, and then she when yeah. she's faced with like a real world situation, I mean, setting aside the fact that Peter is a werewolf, which she doesn't know, or that he's an alpha, which she also doesn't know, it's intimidating in a real world way. And she is intimidated. And I it's it's just interesting to see her assumptions about herself challenged like that. You know, where she keeps having to face the fact that like, yeah, you can you can be strong and confident and still end up in situations where you're like, I don't know what to do here. And that scares me. Absolutely. Yeah. What I love about Allison's character, and we'll see this as this as the series goes on, is that every time Allison gets out of her dip, she rises to the occasion and not not like some kind of theoretical effervescent like you know rising of the spirit or whatever like she gets she gets up against a wall and she realizes like where her like where the boundaries of her competencies are and then she fixes it and she's like now I'm going to learn more now I'm going to be better now I'm going to try harder and sometimes that goes awry <laughs> Yeah, her. Uh, she goes in the wrong direction competency wise, but like she never let something get her down for long. She's like, okay, I don't know something. I'm going to figure it out. I can't do something. I'll learn how to. Um, right. And I really love that about her character, even when I don't love her character sometimes as the series goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even in this one, you know, after she has her breakdown. The next scene is her picking up her bow and practicing using the Derek Hale wanted poster for target practice. She is rising to the occasion in a manner of speaking, but it's also as an audience member, I'm like, is that really your only takeaway from what happened? I'm like, right. Cause really like in that situation, who do you really think you're most in danger from? Right. Right. You know, it's very much a, the danger is already inside the house, you know, right. where it, it's yeah. like, you think, oh, it's this monster that they've got tied up. It's like, nope. Right. The person torturing the monster who you have just literally been introduced to. So yeah, monsters. Yeah. Okay. That's rough. But the person you love torturing the monster who is completely helpless, you might need to be re-examining this. Yeah. On the subject of Kate torturing Derek, he spends most of this episode getting tortured. Yeah. And in the next scene, she taunts him about the romantic relationship that she had tricked him into before she set fire to the Hale house. 
Uh, and she knows he's never told anyone about the relationship. He just carries all that guilt of what happened to his family. So hard to watch. Yeah, Very this is the watch. scene in which Kate reads lines from like the abuser's playbook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just yeah. verbatim. Doesn't mm-hmm. feel the need really to put her spin on him. It's just like, oh, did you not tell anybody about us? Yeah, and then doubles down by sexually assaulting him. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like we can laugh yeah. about it, but that's what that was, you know. It, oh, and yeah, I, absolutely. I was way too like caught up in the drama of everything the first time I watched Teen Wolf to really like. I was just sort of on the surface with the Kate Derrick situation. Yeah, and it it wasn't until I got into fandom where you know it was basically like people were using fanfic to really like deal with a lot of this background story particularly because it is glossed over a lot or used for like dramatic purposes without really getting into Derek's side of it and Derek's mindset and like what that must have done to him emotionally and psychologically and you know that's what that's what fan fiction's for and so it wasn't until I started reading fan fiction and a lot of the fan fictions were you know you would have scenes where characters would have to like spell out to Derek like Kate was a child molester. Like you were under age. Like right. she had the power, you know? And then you go back and you watch these scenes and it's just like, you feel like you need a shower because what she yeah. did to him is just like abhorrent. Yeah. And this scene, like now watching this scene, it just makes me like, it makes my skin crawl. Yeah. And I like, I feel the need to correct her when she's like, oh, you know, handsome young werewolf meets hot girl and I was like no hot grown ass woman adult mm-hmm. person mm-hmm. praise on young boy like that basically yeah. you know in this episode also you know we all we get to see like Peter being really creepy towards Allison and then he attacks mm-hmm. Lydia and so I feel like this this episode is also kind of like Will said where you you want to be like please someone find an adult like someone find an adult and then you want to like take some of these adults and and just take them aside and be like these are children these are underage children that you are flirting with and touching stop it and I I definitely feel the same way I feel like the first time I watched it I was just really caught up in the story and not really thinking about the implications of it but then you know you sit with it for a little bit and you're like well frankly even if he wasn't underage it's still bad (laughs) because first of all rape by deception is a thing yeah Mm -hmm. that would be the case regardless of his age if you remove the age thing from it then you can at least call what they had consensual in that sense because now there's no like statutory situation so even if what they had was consensual and Derek was consenting to it as an adult then all bets are out when she kills his whole family like at that point it doesn't it doesn't age and consent don't matter because she has used him to murder his entire family and so like that nothing erases like the guilt and the trauma of that you know right so there's there no one's mature enough to handle that Correct. Right, right. Correct. So I, now when I go back and watch like scenes like this one, I try to like remember all that and then try to think about like what's going on in Derek's head. And then it's just like super upsetting. The next scene has coach banning Scott from the spring formal because of his failing grades. Knowing Allison needs protection, Scott threatens Jackson into asking her to the dance. Allison agrees to go as friends and convinces Lydia to go with Styles, which is totally his dream come true. Total dream come true. <laughs> So happy for him. <laughs> Great comic relief from Jackson. Like it's like, I mean, all up and through this whole season, I mean, Jackson's very much the straight guy. And he says some stuff that's funny, but it's mainly just like his seriousness that does it. But to have just this great moment where Scott's pleading with him to take Allison to the dance so he can, so she'll go so he can get into the dance and see her. And he's like, I'm totally not going to do it. And then Scott's like, do it. And it just cuts straight to Jackson. He's like, hey, you want to go to this dance with me? That you cut know, is so good. It's just an amazing cut. It just it's the so look on, on Colton's face. And he's really <laughs> funny. Like he's really funny in this scene and in the scene previous with Scott. You know, I wish they played up a little bit more humor with Colton, but I mean, the character is just not funny. Like, I mean, that's right, just yeah. not Jackson, period. Yeah. But it is great when you have this, just this wonderful little moment where he is very funny. And uh, right. I wish we could have gotten more of that. I think Teen Wolf had so many fantastic actors who had incredible range. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I think it really was wonderful to see the writers give such 
complex personalities to the characters. They had like very layered story arcs where we could see different aspects of like comedy, drama, everything from the characters throughout the show. Yeah. But I do love how Scott sets up the call that Allison's car is being towed to go over the loudspeaker to get her away from Peter. I just, I love that moment that actually shows Scott can be clever when he wants to be. And when it comes to saving Allison, he just needs to apply himself. Yes. He's a focus. He just needs to pretend every situation Allison is in danger. Yeah, that's right. Kate, while taunting Derek, realizes that Scott is the other beta. She's able to deduce that which it's not good for Scott. No. no, no, it's not. And kind of sad for Derek because he was doing such a good job like holding out. Yes. yes. In, in Derek's defense though, Kate is very good at, at reading people and yeah. producing yeah. things. I mean, she's very smart and because she's a very cunning hunter and she's right. always reading situations to figure out like what is the best tool to get what I need, you know? And so, you know, she's using the torture to get information out of him, but then it's just, poking him the right way you know also like with the tell yeah you know, like when she re- she realizes that she's like who's the alpha dare you got to tell me and then she realizes because you don't know that's it you won't you're not holding out i'm not just a, a very good torture i'm not beating you up the right way it's just you actually don't have the information i need which means i can shoot you in the face now because you have nothing i need anymore yeah and well and i, I think she also makes that deduction based on having interacted with scott because she's what makes her realize that Scott must be the other beta isn't even anything that Derek says. It's something she said. She says the thing about history repeating. And then she kind of realizes that like maybe some of the same tells that she knew from what happened with Derek, she could also see with Scott. That the way he was behaving, for instance, in Magic Bullet was because he was hiding something right. from them. You know, kind of just taking that information that she had from interacting with Scott and observing him way too closely and realizing what that meant. Right. I need to compare the two because Derek is not a monster. Both of them just know how to kind of play people to get what they want, but Derek does it for much better reasons. Right. <laughs> he does have necessity. Do you think you learned yeah. it from Kate? That I hate he saw to think how that. That he saw how she was to him, and then was like, "I will use that against other people." Granted, but like what you said, he's always doing it for a right reason. He might be going about it the wrong way, but it's yeah. just—it's always like I have to save a life. Something right. awful is going to happen, so I have to flirt. To it's not like I'm going to flirt with this deputy and then murder her family, right? Right. Like she'll never have like, to know. Right. Yeah. yeah. He wouldn't sleep with someone, I feel like, to like get what he wants. Yeah. Right. Yeah, definitely like not. Kate. Also, he doesn't ever get what he wants. So there would he be no point. He never gets what he wants. So. Yes. He tries very hard, but fails a lot. He does. Um, he lot. fails so much. But he much. always tries. And that's the thing. That's why you love him, because he always keeps trying. So. Gold yeah. star, Derek Hale. Gold star, buddy. Right there he, on the bridge. He, he deserves a gold star. He tries. And I think it's also like he he feels like he has a certain number of tools at his disposal to get someone to help him. Right. Because they're not going to help him because he says, I need help. Right. Right. And so they're like, flirt, threaten, prove that they need me for something. Yeah. Are his three options. Yeah. And flirting is like the last of the last. Yeah. Yeah. He does not prefer that one. Even in this episode, uh, Scott only wants to contact him because he realizes Allison is in danger. So yeah, now he's willing to help Derek. Right. Yeah. Clearly he wants more Derek's help than even to help Derek. It's about him. Right. Allison and Jackson are at the dance. Jackson's mostly drinking his way through it. Yes. Styles still super happy that Lydia is with him, but yeah, he keeps asking if she'll dance with him and she just keeps declining. Finally, she's convinced after he gives her a speech about how he knows that she's a secret math genius, just pretending to be dumb. And he just knows she's going to go on to do great things. And she she just seems really happy that someone finally sees her despite her best efforts of hiding it. 
Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. I kind of had mixed feelings about the speech. Like he brought it back. He 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 brought it back. But there was a little there was a piece in there of like get your cute little ass up and like I know that beneath that cold lifeless exterior is a human soul. I was like, what? Sometimes you're really around- laying it on with the compliment styles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Like sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, it do, it's a little neggy, and I feel like sometimes in his interactions with Lydia specifically, Styles kind of oscillates between naively sweet and Xander heresy. Yes, I feel like as someone who ended up being a huge Stidia fan, like this this scene was like a moment for me, and mm-hmm. so it's hard for me to like really watch it with with like very critical eyes because I just want it to be like this wonderful moment where Lydia understands that like Styles gets her, but I can see like the the greater story being told here is that and it, and it's happening through season one so like what I want to be happening is I want Lydia to realize that like Styles is it for her that like he sees her and he's always seen her and he gets her and he's this wonderful guy that will care about her more than Jackson does and that will take every piece and part of her and like give it the attention and the respect and the love that it deserves but as a woman who has in the past been made to feel like it's my fault that I don't like someone back. I understand that what's really happening here is that Lydia loves Jackson and Styles needs to just realize that. And if he could work on building a, a true friendship with Lydia, I think that he would find a lot more like be just having this weird, awkward, awful, pining crush on her keeps him apart from her. But I think he could find a lot of fulfillment in being really good friends with Lydia and being a friend who sees her and a friend who accepts all parts of her. And what Styles is doing in a lot of these scenes is making Lydia that her not liking him back is something that he can change through like sheer force of will. Mm -hmm. And that's not how we want men to feel like their interactions with women should go. Like you can't just stalk me into liking you, you know, you can't gift me into liking you. You can't speech me into liking you. Like if I don't like you, I don't like you, like leave me alone, you know? And so it's really hard for me to see like both sides of what's happening here in this scene, but it, it it is definitely there. And I also just think that sometimes we've had to realize in this cultural moment that we're in right now, that like the things that we love won't always age well, you know, and yeah, we is. have to decide mm-hmm. whether or not we're going to continue to love them and continue to watch them and whether we're going to be okay with looking mm-hmm. at them through new eyes. And so you know, I don't think that anyone in this speech was trying to do anything erroneous, but, you know, we look back, especially on dialogue sometimes from previous shows and just think like, yikes, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I, I really, I still love this scene for what it is and I understand like what it isn't. So. And I, I, w- I will say when he realizes that she needs to go to Jackson, he deals with it really gracefully. He does. Right. Yeah, he's not a bitter Betty about it. I think when we were watching it and it got to that, because I had made the comment about Xander Harris and then it got to that part and you were like, Xander Harris definitely would have been just the worst about this realization that she wanted to go find. He would just be awful. Sulk. And Styles really isn't. He does find that he has enough respect for her that he's not going to be like oh really you're going to go find Jackson and like honestly he's not wrong that Jackson's the worst and she deserves better you know it's just also that it's not about him right right, this is something she needs to figure out for herself that she deserves more out of a relationship than she could ever get from Jackson and he really does when when he comes to that realization that she she's gonna go find Jackson he deals with it very gracefully to his credit and you know he is I'm not gonna say boys will be boys but I do think he has space to grow and he does grow and that that matters you know he does learn and become better right I also just really really love the delivery of when Lydia stands up and says 
it's the Fields Medal I'll be winning. Mm -hmm. It's just perfect because Styles has just said that he's one of the few people who understands not just that she's smart, but that she's a genius. Yeah. Right. And so when she says this line, it's like, she knows, you know, right. just like yeah. Yeah, she puts on yeah. a show, but like she has goals. Yeah. And she's thought about this, you know, right. and, right. and looked into this. Like if I did keep all this under wraps, but on the low, you know, went into the field of mathematics, what could I do? Right. right. Yeah. I love, uh, I love Lydia. I love Lydia so much. She's probably one of my favorite characters. Yeah, me too. Great. But yeah, so while this is happening with Styles and Lydia, Coach catches that Scott has snuck into the dance despite his warnings that he would drag him out if he caught him there. But Scott, with some quick thinking, runs over to Danny and starts dancing with Danny, knowing that if Coach tries to separate them, it's not going to look great for Coach. <laughs> that that scene is is very funny. I love it's very this funny. scene, and I also love in the like after, like sort of in the off camera stuff, you can <laughs> you can hear Coach being like, "What are you looking at, Greenberg?" Yeah, and I I really love all of the Greenberg mentions throughout the series, and it, yes. it just seems like anytime the writers' room needed to like throw something funny in there, it was like Greenberg. It's just so great to me, and it, <laughs> also that we never meet Greenberg. It, yeah. Right. It's like this little trope that's like this funny inside joke of this off-camera kid that's like the worst. <laughs> <laughs> that he and Coach have this unseen rivalry. Like there, there's like this war happening between, you know, Greenberg and Coach happening all off-camera and probably in Coach's head. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but, yeah. but Forty Adams and as the coach plays flustered very well, like uncomfortable, like he's gone too far and has to reel it in. Like he, he plays that, that emotional state very well. Yeah. And, uh, it's always, it's always fun to watch. It's always fantastic to watch. Fun fact, script coordinator, Damon Jackson has a cameo as Danny's date. He's the one that kind of gives Danny a look like, who were you just dancing with? Right. I went off to get us drinks and now you're like dancing with some other dude. What's, what's up? <laughs> I walk away for two minutes. Right. And everyone's standing right. around staring at you and right. this dude, like, what's happening? And I also love how Danny just is kind of like, straight dudes, man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Straights. What are, like, with them? what are you gonna do with them? <laughs> their their motives are impenetrable. We'll, we'll never know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I also love that Danny's a good enough sport that he like, lets Scott reel him in and then he lets Scott pull him in like even closer. <laughs> like, he's just like, what is happening? <laughs> Yeah. Danny is such a good sport. He, he is. really is just like, he is. he's huffy, but, <laughs> but, but he's like, ah, oh, what's the harm? <laughs> no, you're right. He's a good sport. He's, he's huffy and he kind of complains a little bit, but he doesn't reject. Right. You know, he, he goes with it. He goes along with it. So yeah. Like and, and that's, what's wonderful. He knew for certain that Miguel was not Sal's cousin. And he was just like, whatever. <laughs> like, He's like, is this is this what my afternoon's gonna be? Okay. Right. <laughs> is this what's happening? I'm not totally mad at this idea. Yeah. So it's like, oh, is Scott pulling me to a dance at the formal? All right, let's well let's this go is going somewhere. Happening. Yeah. So we'll it's happens. easier to just not ask questions and go along just to go along with it. Yeah. Well, Jackson has snuck off outside. And he believes that he actually sees the alpha in the woods. So he goes to it asking to be turned because that's just his new desire. He, he just wants to be one of them. He wants that power, super fast, strong, everything that Scott has. But he walks up to the red eyes only to realize it's not the alpha's eyes. It's the beams on the guns of Chris and the other hunters. He tells them that Scott is the other beta, but he makes them promise that they won't hurt him. They pinky swear. Oh, Jackson. <laughs> Jackson, yeah. you sweet summer child, you. I know. I know. Uh, but that, I love that scene. I think it's fantastic because Jackson's pleading to be this thing, to get the power and all that. And I just remember watching that scene that it's just like, I love the underlying, the underlying current of Jackson's wants and desires you know, from what we've talked about already, that it's just how, you know, when is enough enough that he'll feel accepted? That when is right. enough enough that he'll be happy with wherever he is in life, like whatever his station is or 
or whatever. And it just, it, it sucks because it kind of feels like the answer is never. Like right. it's never, Jackson can't be happy that he has this, this emotional roadblock in his head, this thing he can't get past. And it's that he's adopted, you know, and that he's, he perpetually sees himself as this outsider and that hopefully one day he's able to get past that, you know. He should go to therapy. He should go to therapy. You know, in Speaking Hills, there have to be like a million therapists in this town, <laughs> you know, there have to be, there has yes. to be. So their, their rates have to be super low because there's so many of them. So it's like, feels like sure. a win-win, but it just, it's, it's a great scene just because I feel like it adds to Jackson's three-dimensionality that he's, mm-hmm. you know, again, going back to the pilot episode of the series where he's just the jock bully. That's it. Right. And then you get to this scene where he's pleading with a monster to be bitten by the monster yeah. so that he can feel you know, he, he can feel powerful and better and, and attain whatever this thing is he can't ever attain. Perfection. Right? It's just perfection. And it's just sad. It's just really sad. I really love this scene because I feel like we get two sort of reversals of what we thought Jackson's character was. And one is that when it comes to obtaining what he wants, apparently he can show some humility. Like he's pleading, like he's crawling on the ground practically yeah yeah. you know and so if it's down to like getting what he wants then he is willing to like beg and plead and crawl and I you know I think that the Jackson that we were first introduced to is a very very proud person and so that's interesting and then we also see that maybe maybe just like the Grinch he has like an itty bitty tiny little heart in there somewhere because (laughs) you know he doesn't even like Scott so like yes Scott manages to somewhat plead with him on his basis of like liking Allison to like help Scott protect her he still has to really threaten him for Jackson to do it and we see in that scene that Jackson really only cares about Jackson but then we see in this scene that that's not necessarily 100% true because he is thoughtful enough and compassionate enough to like pull out this little tiny inkling of care to ask like but you're not gonna hurt him right you know and I think that that's also sort of something that we haven't really seen from Jackson before so this this scene I think really is a turning point to start seeing like little chinks in Jackson's armor which is interesting it's wonderful and and even to touch on a scene we'll get to in a second but like when Styles discovers that Jackson has kind of given up the secret. Jackson's like has like regret. Like he looks mm-hmm. regretful that he knows he's messed up real bad, you know. And you know, and I feel like you're right. These are just these wonderful chinks in in the Jackson character that he's not terrible. He's not a awful human being. And you're right. He doesn't want. He's like he doesn't like Scott. He's never gonna like Scott probably. But he's like, well, I'm going to die. Right. I mean, this is. I, I just I, want him to be bad at lacrosse. Yes. Yes. I just right. want him to be bad at lacrosse. I, you know, and and it's wonderful. So that when he does come back in and Styles confronts him, and that he he's genuinely like he has remorse for this thing that he's allowed to happen. You know, and that's great because you don't really get that in the bully character. The bully character is just some asshole. Right. This is a big moment for Scott and Allison because Scott confesses his love for her at the dance and he's worked up the nerve to tell her the truth about who he is because after a heart to heart with Mama McCall, he just feels like that's what needs to happen for the relationship. That's a great scene with Melissa. This scene would have- Oh uh, yeah, we skipped over that, didn't we? Oh yeah, in the bedroom where she's fixing his tux. She's so, so faster and (laughs) oh, so good. So good. She's so, she's so perfect. Yeah. She calls him a dumbass and it's just the greatest. I know. So I mean, tough mom love. Sometimes you need it. Yeah. But I also, when she's like, say it, you know, like say it and then say it often and then say it differently and then say it better. You know, like she gets to give him this advice, like as not only a mom, but like as a woman, like how to speak to the woman you love. And that that's really beautiful to me. Yeah. I love that little speech from her. It's great. Yeah. So, so good. But then by the time Scott says it to Allison, I'm like way too annoyed with him to find it. <laughs> like that whole scene is supposed to like hit different. I'm just like, oh God, Scott, come on. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the first season was, yeah, a lot of me being really frustrated with Scott, but I loved all of the side characters so much. Yeah, absolutely. Lydia goes out to the lacrosse field to look for Jackson, 
but she doesn't find him. Instead, she is brutally attacked and bitten by Peter. Styles arrives just a moment too late to warn her. It's great. It's a great scene because he's like, she's across the field and she sees the figure coming out of the darkness and she thinks it's Jackson and Styles is running and calling her name. And then you get the great moment where she falls down and her dress is bloody and it's just like, oh my God, are we going to lose somebody? You know, it's, it's so good. It's too soon. We have so much more we need to learn about Lydia. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So good. Yeah. And then when Styles, like the way he slides in on his knees like to almost like try to cover her and Peter yeah. beats him to it. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's fantastic. It's, it's just so good. This is possibly one of my, it might possibly be my favorite scene in the first season. I know director Russell McKay mentioned that he loved this episode because it was the first time that Tyler O'Brien really had a chance to show just what range he had and to tackle a really dramatic scene. And I completely agree. I love his comedy, but Dylan O'Brien, oh, he's just so incredible. And you can actually, I feel like, see the conflicting anger, but also fear that Styles has in this moment. He wants to protect Lydia. He wants to, I feel like, strangle Peter for doing that. Yeah. But he knows he's no match for Peter. Yeah. So, yeah, and they're just, when they're both crouched over her, and it's just, ugh. I don't know. It's just so great. This episode and the next episode were the moment that I realized that I would watch this show for Dylan until it ended. Like that it was a great show and that everyone in it was really great. But like I was going to be keeping an eye on him because the way that he captures Styles like impotent rage and he he brings that up again in Styles a lot throughout the rest of the series. The fact that like Styles cares just as deeply about everything, but the fact that he's a vulnerable human makes it hard for him to do something about his rage and his anger or his, you know, his need to like protect the people he loves makes his character so unique and interesting. And I think Dylan does such a great job of putting that emotion front and center when it's necessary because Scott and Derek know that they have the ability to protect the people that they care about or to protect themselves from threats because they're werewolves and they have these abilities and that isn't a guarantee but it certainly helps them throw themselves into danger and right. I think one of the amazing things about Styles's character in this scene and then we will see it over and over again in the series is that Styles knows that he doesn't have those abilities and that it is much more likely that he will be maimed or killed and he still puts himself on the line every single time for the people he cares about and he finds a way to make a contribution. And I, I really, really love that about him. He will always fight. Like, I mean, he's going to fight for the people he cares about. You know, it's like, and you're right. He will throw himself into danger, even though it's like, I am the weakest out of everybody. Like, you know, it's like, I could just get taken out so easily, but someone I care about is in danger, which means I got to right. jump in the fray. And that's right. just, there's no second guessing it. It's just Go. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I think you're right, Calissa. I feel like he he knows that Peter could rip his throat out and he still you can see him holding himself back to eat like to just try anyway, like to just try to kill him anyway. Like he knows he'll kill him in the blink of an eye, but he's like weighing the odds of like whether it's worth it just because he's so angry that he's hurt Lydia. And it's so interesting that like all that plays out on Dylan's face with minimal dialogue and you're like you yeah. get you get all of that so fun little fact here will actually gave me the clothes that dylan o'brien is wearing in the scene and what? so thank you will yeah they actually still have like the dirt on them from where he's like crouched in the mud that means they haven't been washed yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's great Allison and Scott leave the dance to be alone. The hunters try to hit Scott with a car, forcing him to shift as he jumps onto the hood to save himself. And Allison witnesses him turning into a werewolf for the very first time. It's exciting and super heartbreaking just because Scott is forced into the situation and forced to reveal himself to Allison. And she looks also heartbroken that this guy she totally cares about is one of these monsters that her aunt has been torturing, you know, yeah. and it's, oh, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's so, and the look on Scott's face when he realizes that she's seen it, oh, it's awful. 
is just yeah, awful. Yeah, Crystal Reed and Tyler Posey acted the heck out of this scene. Yeah. Because it's really hard to do understated, I think. And her face, like she's not crying and she's not as shocked as she should be because, you know, an Allison who found out Scott's a werewolf without knowing werewolves exist would be like, really beyond yeah. surprised but she's just found out that werewolves exist so she doesn't even have to convince herself of what she's seen she right. can immediately go to like my boyfriend is a werewolf and just all of that like playing out on her face and then realizing like immediately what the repercussions of this are going to be and then also just as a girl who feels lied to by a boy you know also something that I thought about really recently was the fact that these people had to act through werewolf makeup. Right. And how hard that had to be to emote with like heavy yeah. prosthetics on and like hats off, hats off. Cause I, I don't know how you do it, but it, I really do love the look of just like absolute like regret on Scott's face that he waited just like a second too late to come clean. Yes. Yeah. Um, and to make, to make your face do all of that with, also being wolfed out must be difficult. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. All the props to Tyler Posey. Yeah, it's a <laughs> testament so to their acting ability. Too, so to close. Telling her. Just, so close. Mm, so close. Interesting that that scene takes place with Allison on the bus when in, is it Second Chance at First Line? Whenever Scott has the dream right. about him killing her on the bus. On the bus. bus. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's no, great. It's a great little little callback that he pushes her to safety inside the place where she wasn't safe or where he believed she hadn't been safe the previous episode. It's right. It's great. It's really, really good. And it's so sad because you're like, because you just see it and it's heartbreaking. But then you're just like, this is not going to be good. Like, right. This is yeah. just the worst possible thing that could happen. And then Peter's out there, too. Right. You know, so it's just like they just kind of I think Teen Wolf has always been good at just kind of piling on right, the main yeah. characters. Until There's you get never to... just one thing wrong. <laughs> right. No. Right. And it's it's great because it's like you're constantly putting characters in the corners and, and piling on so much stuff where by the time you get to the finale of a season, you're like, how could they possibly come out of this? OK. And I mean, I guess we're just going to see what happens next week to see if they come out yeah. OK on this, because Again, there's an alpha out there. The alpha has bitten Lydia. And now Allison knows that Scott's a werewolf. Right. Derek's still tied up in the oh, and Derek is of caught his family by, home. Yeah, that's right. Derek is caught. It's just like all mm -hmm. the all the main characters mm -hmm. are in a bad place, are in like yeah. the worst possible place they could be moving into the final episode of this season. So yeah. And I mean, let's all like say a prayer for Chris Archant, who just found out that his daughter's boyfriend's a werewolf and <laughs> who he's like sworn to hate and kill. So I mean. Yeah, he never likes Scott uh, anyway. Yeah, he didn't like Scott. <laughs> but and, and I also think there's like an element of irony because Scott went to such lengths to be able to go to the dance and be with Allison, and he kind of told himself it was because he wanted to be able to keep an eye on her and keep her safe, and that ends up having the exact opposite effect because the Alpha didn't go after her mm -hmm. at the party or at the dance, like he thought that the alpha might do. And all that's happened is now she found out that he was a werewolf. She found out that he was a werewolf, not through him telling her, which is even worse. And it's in a situation where she's seeing him face off against hunters, including her family. So in an attempt to protect Allison, he's really put her in the worst possible situation. Right. Classic Scott McCall. Classic Scott. <laughs> Classic Scott. But it's fantastic. It's a great end of, I guess, maybe our second act of this season. You know, it just kind of puts the characters in the worst possible position. And now they've got to find some way to survive and get out of it. Fantastic. Just a great, fun episode of this show. Yeah. A lot of great character moments and just some fun action at the end. And just a lot of reveals happening. A lot of information is coming to the front and none of it's good. And now we just have to see in the next episode what the fallout of that's going to be. Yeah. And I can't wait. So you said that you had a story about some steric art. So oh my gosh. Yes. And I, I will give it to you. I'll send it to you so you guys can post it on your social media. So 
I had gotten really into like Teen Wolf. And so I knew all about the ships and I knew all about, you know, a lot of the the fan stuff and I had seen some fan art. And so I kind of knew a little bit about what it might look like, even though I don't do it myself because I'm definitely not an artist. And I had a professor in grad school and this was a college professor that I had then become social media friends with. He was gay and he would share a lot of advocacy posts, which was great because then I could share them too. And there was a page, and I don't know if it was an organization or this is just the name of the page, but there was a page he would share a lot from called Equality House. And a lot of it was about getting like civil rights for gay couples to marry and adopt and things like that. And I noticed he had posted one day this little cartoon, it looked like, like a watercolor almost, of a gay couple um, laying in bed, like on a lazy Saturday morning with their like little infant toddler between them. And it was just like a really cute picture of a, of a, of a family spending time together. And it said something about like, it's ridiculous that people think that gay people shouldn't adopt because then they'll turn their kids, you know, gay, like, you know, a lot of gay people come from straight families. So it doesn't make any sense. It was basically an advocacy post. And I didn't really think anything of it. I was like, oh, I liked it. It was cute. And I kept scrolling. And then something made me stop and scroll back. And I was like, is that baby wearing a wolf onesie? <laughs> like it has little ears. And That's then I adorable. started looking at the couple and I was like, that guy has a shaved head. And that guy <laughs> has like an eight pack and like spiked <laughs> up black hair. And I was like, this is a Teen Wolf fan art. Like this is 100% steric with their cute little like wolf onesie baby. And I was like, to be sure that someone shared this, not knowing what it was. Right. Or the person running the social media for Equality House was like, watch me get one over on oh. these people. <laughs> no one's going to know that it's steric fan art. I'm just going to share it. You know, like I, I, to this day, who knows what happened, but. I've kept that screenshot because it was just like so cute. And I was just adorable. like, can't wait to see this. Me too. Oh, so excited. I, I choose to believe it's, it is the former of those two options. That if yeah. someone was just like, let's see if I can get away with this. 100%. Someone in fandom was like, watch me work. Here it comes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I love it. All right, Wolfies, that wraps up the beta section for formality. And now we're about to dive into spoilers, not just for this episode, but the whole Teen Wolf series. If you want to stay spoiler free for all of the excellent stories to come, jump out now and we'll see you next week. But if this isn't your first time in Beacon Hills and you want to hear more, don't move a muscle. Here comes the alpha. This is a joke to you? Sweetheart, there are werewolves running around in the world. Everything's a joke to me. How else do you think I stay sane? All right, Wolfies, we're going to jump over to our interview with Teen Wolf writer Angela Harvey and Matt McDonough, former director of online engagement at MTV. Let's have a listen. Angela, Will told us that you had some fun stories about filming the Macy scenes. Do you want to share any of those? I don't know how fun they were. <laughs> um, and also Matt was there that night. Oh, were you? Oh, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. well then, also please share. That night was like a trial by fire. It was both of our first time doing product placement. And like literally nothing went the way that we had planned it to go. The Macy's had told us that they would be able to leave the um, gate open so that it would look like the mall was open. But then when it got to be time, mall security was like, nope, that gate has got to be down. So it's like when you see the, the uh, when you see... Lydia and Allison coming up the escalator and there's that big Macy's banner that's like basically blocking a giant silver gate coming down. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. Like everything happened. There were like a million people from Macy's on set who were like very particular about every sign that had to be in the shot. The dresses they could and could not pull off the rack. It was an experience. They also weren't really in contact with the management of the of the store that we were filming in either so it was a macy's corporate people our integrated marketing team our ad sales team i don't remember why i was there or why i was asked to be there i've been thinking about this for days 
but I was, I think I had to, I think I was getting maybe behind the scenes because I think we did a little behind the scenes video of that episode, but I don't remember it and I can't find it now. But uh, it was definitely trying to give the client more of what they wanted, which was like, you know, their product featured, but I had never done anything like that in my life. And it was a good uh, learning experience. As all things should be, I, I would hope. Angela, since y'all were shooting, y'all were doing block shooting at the time, there's like some other Macy's scenes in this season. Were they all done that night? Is that why it was it was like an all-nighter? Because they were rack- doing multiple episodes in one night? I don't think so. Oh, okay. We were block shooting, but, and I know that those scenes in Macy's go by real quick on screen. I was just talking to Matt about that. Like, how were, how was that all that we filmed when we were there for <laughs> Angela and I, Angela and I just watched the episode right, right before this, so it could be fresh in our minds. And in my mind and in hers, the Macy's scene is like the crux of the episode. <laughs> I, I just remember being there for what seemed like days. Tears were definitely shed. <laughs> like, oh, that wow. was a long night. That might be the longest night of overnight filming. Like I, ca- I can't think of a night outside in the cold, outside in the cold and the rain, there was no night that was longer than Macy's night. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That was long. All right. Wow. It's definitely not something you would like think just looking at it because yeah, right. it kind of goes pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it's like 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I feel like if, if you're like, oh, that was the longest night of my life. And it's like, oh, y'all were shooting like some epic fight scene with like all the werewolves and all the makeup. It's like, no, we were just characters were walking around the mall there was one escalator (laughs) there was an escalator and you know (laughs) matt you're credited as a director of online engagement what kind of online marketing did you do for the first season of teen wolf i don't know how imdb credits (laughs) get made i think at some point that was a title that i had i worked at mtv as a freelancer and i worked on skins and then when skins was canceled after one season i remember being handed the pilot script for teen wolf and my boss saying like we'd really like for you to stay on and work on this show and create an online community for it. I was really doing social media and marketing and promos and but pretty junior level. And so I, I was on season one, I was kind of in charge of making sure all of the cast members got Twitter accounts. And I was very involved in the promo and the marketing campaign that we did for season one, and then went to set a few times to gather behind the scenes stuff. But definitely it my my kind of role grew season by season. But season one, I was just like the social media guy. (laughs) So I would just go and then also would shoot some stuff with my own camera for little behind the scenes videos that we put out through the season. And then, yeah, just a a lot of the marketing campaign, like all the promos and the trailers and how we would kind of communicate to the fans was kind of a plan from the beginning. Were there any cast members who were like more reluctant to get on social media or more who were really like enthusiastic about it? Oh yeah. Most of them were more reluctant. It was new. I, my, I went back, my first Instagram posts are from the set of Teen Wolf. Um, So Instagram was brand new when we were doing the marketing campaign for season one. I don't even think I was actively trying to get any of them to join Instagram. I was just trying to get them to make Twitter accounts. I remember making Tyler's Twitter account the first time that I went to set. And, you know, Dylan was way more like not wanting to be on social media or not also just just not really at being as interested in it. Really, I'm, I'm trying to think like Posey was the only one who really wanted to join Twitter and Holland really knew that she had to and was like very savvy at here's what I should be doing and here's how I should be talking to people who watch the show when it comes out. And the rest of them were kind of just like, oh, do I have to? Fine. <laughs> Colton had a Twitter. Wow. But there was a really scary period of time where I also just had all of their Twitter passwords <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I made them all from my laptop. I didn't do anything bad with them. <laughs> cool. But you had the nuclear codes if you exactly. wanted to. Exactly. <laughs> I did have the codes. I mean, there was actually a time season after season one aired in the US, it started to air internationally because it was owned by MGM. So we would do all these. They And they did actually a press tour where Jeff, I think Jeff went, but it was Tyler and Crystal went to South America with MGM. And while it was while the show was airing in the US. And I just remember that 
I had to, I don't, I think this is, that's fine. No one's going to care about this. But like I logged in to Tyler's Twitter as Tyler with his permission, of course, and live tweeted one of the episodes just as Tyler Posey. <laughs> hey, you do what you got to do for that engagement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you know. So could you tell us a little bit about making Wolf Watch, which was 25 episodes, sort of a recap slash interview show? I think I was a field producer. So Wolf Watch, I don't remember how it started. I think it was just at the success of Teen Wolf. You know, they wanted an after show where people could talk about it. I did, did all the online marketing and shows that we would do. So any of the behind the scenes, we had our own show called the After After Show was the uh, kind of what I more creatively drove, which was just a fun, goofy 15 minute, very, very bizarre comedy uh, <laughs> kind of exercise that we worked with an amazing team of writers and Morgan Evans, the host is a brilliant comedian and writer. And then Wolf Watch was kind of the agreement of everyone of like, well, if you want to make all these things, can you also produce Wolf Watch and do a bit? It was much more kind of traditional linear TV after show. So, you know, MTV would do after shows for the challenge and teen mom reunions and <laughs> all of those. So it was kind of like, what's the teen wolf version of that? It was challenging. I think it was, it was really hard to make, to make wolf watch because it wasn't, it was on top of everyone else's work. Like mm -hmm. I would right. be trying to wrangle people on set and then trying to get them to go to shoots at the same time but they were always still filming the show while we were also doing this. So Jeff would still be writing, you know, the last couple of episodes for the season. And, you know, Angela knows like the writer's room was intense and, and always like very last minute and coming up with these fantastic ideas. And the cast was exhausted. I remember having to pick up Holland because she hadn't slept in like three days and we didn't want her to drive a car. You know, it's, it's, it was, it's a, you know, it's a show about werewolves. A lot of it takes place at night in the woods. So everyone was exhausted. So Wolf Watch is a little triggering for me because it associates with this, like, I always had to be the bad guy. I would just be like, hey, I know you just shot for 18 hours. Can you go talk about how fun this show is? Uh, <laughs> out of a live studio audience. <laughs> yeah. I remember I remember one in particular, and I don't remember, it, 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 I don't remember what we were, I think it was definitely a finale. And I just remember that there was a casted audience. It was 7.15 in the morning and everyone is in like party clothes. And the idea was that it was like at a club celebrating the finale. It was 7.15 in the morning. Everyone was <laughs> an extra. Everyone was really tired and cranky. But Wolf Watch, I, I will say was like, it was a great crew to work with. And I also liked doing it because it got me to also sneak in a lot of other kind of fan engagement that was there. So we got to bring fans out for it. We got to celebrate fans with like a fan of the week kind of component to it. And I got to also use that budget and that crew to film stuff that I thought that fans would really care about. Most of that stuff went online because that's where our fans were. It was so fun the, yeah. that you just made Teen Wolf you and you just made it so fun to engage with. And I feel like that's what helped fans be so passionate is because re they really felt like they were part of it. Right. It was, it was a lot of fun. I learned about fandom from this entire experience and I put my foot in my mouth many times too. Like, I feel like we all kind of learned languages and learned behaviors and made mistakes and tried to learn from them more. And then, but in the meantime, got to do a lot of really cool things and, uh, and make a lot of, make a lot of people's dreams come true. It was always, it never got old. I, I haven't had the experience since, and I don't really think that I ever will again, but just, you know, that kind of being able to, you know, introduce someone to their idol or someone that they really care about, even in in people like Angela and Jeff and just letting people in on the creative experience. I still talk to a lot of Teen Wolf fans through social media and texts and via Instagram DM and so many people who have kind of found great creative lanes in their lives to pursue is really cool. Just because if we could be any kind of small part of someone's journey to that. I, I, I really like that. And I think Teen Wolf gave me such a huge opportunity too to figure out who I am and what I want to do. And and I know like Angela and, and and her origin story also like super inspiring. And and that kind of creative development was something that that made the show really special. Oh I love that answer. Absolutely. 
Angela, speaking of your origin story, how did you and Teen Wolf come together for the first time? How did how did you end up on the show? It was such a long and winding and kind of random road. After film school, I ended up back in Atlanta. I was couch surfing on my mom at my mom's house, and um, I worked on a couple of movies. This was like before production was huge in Atlanta. I think The Walking Dead and Vampire Diaries were the only things that were filming in Atlanta at the time. And so then MTV wanted to bring Teen Wolf to Atlanta. And they were looking for an Atlanta-based producer. And then like around that same time, Joe, I had been assisting him for a couple of years at that point. And he was giving him more and more of the budget work to do. And I was like, oh my God, I hate this. And he's like, if you hate the budget, you don't want to produce. <laughs> he's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be a writer. He's like, give me something you wrote. And so I, I did. I gave him a couple of things I'd written. And then the next thing we did was Teen Wolf. And he slipped a couple of those scripts to Jeff. And then season two, they wanted to do Teen Wolf The Hunt, the fan engagement game, and none of the writers wanted to do it. It was like, it's a lot of work. <laughs> and they all were on other shows. So at that point, so um, I was like, I'll do it. And then I ended up getting staffed on Teen Wolf as a writer for season three after we did Teen Wolf The Hunt. Yeah, you I'm all kind of writing and writing, but like, it worked. <laughs> Yeah, I actually wanted to ask about Teen Wolf, The Hunt. What was it like writing in that format? It was really crazy and weird because that was actually the first thing I'd ever been paid to write in my life. So I was approaching it very much as a, a screenwriter, but it was an interactive game. So I was writing it in script format in line with the story that I had, because I had been in the writer's room as an assistant between seasons one and two. And so I knew like the, the ins and outs of the story and where we could slot in story, but I didn't necessarily know what fan engagement was like and what it was going to be like to play this game. So it was Matt and Danielle and that team on that side who were able to like take what I wrote in terms of the story piece and make it work in a game online so it was a lot of fun but it was like we're, we're cranking out 30 page scripts every week for what was that like 10 weeks oh wow it, it was, wow so, yeah yeah it was a lot of work but at the time I was super psyched to do it because it was in between seasons and it was like the money that helped me like move to LA and change kind of everything so I love Teen Wolf the Hunt <laughs> That's awesome. remember when we like shot in the uh what we, there was like a mannequin in the in the car where did we shoot that was it at the stages it was at the it was at the office and we just filmed like a mannequin in a body bag coming out of a trunk because it was all like yeah, cell phone true. videos and and that that's when i got robbed that's when oh, i God. remember yes that was for the hunt. I filmed, I flew to Atlanta because by season two, I was going to Atlanta like every two weeks to film something or or get behind the scenes or do, we, my team did like all the international promos too. And for the hunt, it was just like, I think I recorded all the videos on my laptop, just like, like on the webcam because they were supposed to be like, you're video chatting with styles and this and that. And then I, there were all my shoots and I got home. And I hadn't slept in days and I just like fell asleep. My roommates left. Somebody forgot to lock the door and I got robbed in like the early morning. Someone stole my laptop out of my bed. While I was <gasps> oh sleeping. my God. Like the bed you uh, were in? Oh, the bed I was sleeping in. Someone <gasps> stole my laptop out of my bed. And oh. that's how I learned to back up all of your video files because I had just returned. Everything was on my computer. <sighs> And I had to fly right back to Atlanta, but everyone felt really bad for me. And so it was, it was easy. There were really short videos too, but that was, well, yeah, that was, yeah, that was like the, the, the mannequin in the trunk that was Lydia typing on her laptop. That was the first time I had, well, this was just audio, so I don't know if it was on that computer or not, but I will never forget the first time an actor read the words that I wrote and it was Michael Hogan, and we went in his trailer in between setups, and he read the words, and then as soon as we were done, he complimented the writing, not knowing oh. that I had written it. Oh. Oh. And I, I just cried. Oh. <laughs> He's the nicest. So nice. 
sweetest. The, there's something also about that, like he's so experienced and he's also like been, he's such a, he's such a hustler in terms of his career and just kind of taking jobs and doing whatever he needs to do. And he also takes it so seriously that doing stuff like that, like little in between setups, can you do this thing, whether it was an interview or a web series, he just had so much fun with it and was just so, he's such a great person to work with. He's such yeah, a he was, pro. He very was talented. Very, too. very professional. And I drove him once. This is back when I was, this was in 3A before I was the writer assistant. And I had to pick him up at his, at whatever apartment I think we had him in. And it was, I think like early, early morning, it was still dark. So I had to pick him up and bring him to set and uh, I remember being very intimidated by him at the beginning because he because in my mind he was Colonel Ty and Gerard you know people who are not the nicest people in the world very intense characters. very intense <laughs> very intense but I remember he made a joke and that got me to laugh in the car and then we just started chatting and I remember I started to ask him about like Teen Wolf and Battlestar, but then he just peppered me with questions all the time. Like he just wanted to know everything like I had done like to get to this. And, and like, he didn't really want to talk about himself, but it was just, he was so nice the entire time. And he was great. Just such a, such a kind gentleman. When I was Googling stuff, I did find, I don't know, was it, is it your website or was it your Tumblr where there was like some photos you had taken, including like Teen Wolf promo shoots that it looked like you had personally taken. And they were really oh, yeah. incredible. They, there was, that was, yeah, I, I was a photographer coming into MTV. And so I would also photograph, especially like season one, just, you know, take snapshots and do it. And then we ended up in corporate. And then I was actually my, you know, I, I remember I got paid separately because us weekly wanted a behind the scenes photograph so i just remember it was like i would one of my photos was a spot the difference uh, uh photo in the back <laughs> of us weekly magazine in 2011 and then i do i also remember taking this picture which is which was a never used setup for the first kind of key art shoot which looks like a romance novel of like crystal and tyler like passionately embracing in front of a big fan um that season one promos we shot um we shot so many different versions of of that we shot two completely different promos one which never aired and we shot I think maybe four or five different key art setups for that too and it was a really there were talking about too many cooks it was every single executive at MTV basically just trying to decide like everybody's look how would they feature them where should they stand should dylan o'brien be in the cast photo was a question that first poster that first teen wolf poster where he's like in the back like so he's uh <laughs> he's like a third of the scale of every other actor and every he's in the very back and we were like uh, what are they doing what's happening i guess <laughs> not having been on set and seeing the magic they weren't necessarily on the same page with the rest of us it was you know it was a it was a sexy werewolf show <laughs> we didn't know about you know every single actor <laughs> uh but yeah that was definitely that was definitely the the mtv mgm it was the other company but that was the like you know make sure we get colton haynes's jawline and as front and center as we possibly can uh jawline. which uh, not and no no shade against colton haynes's jawline it cuts glass it's amazing but like, <laughs> It's definitely not including, in, in retrospect, not including Dylan O'Brien in a cast photo. It seems so insane. But yeah, we did all the individual pieces and then um, we shot a whole entirely different promo that was Scott and Allison. It was a love scene where they're kind of making out, a lot of heavy petting while he's turning into a werewolf and he's and she doesn't realize it. Never aired because the one that aired was a lot better, but it was always a... <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it was, I still liked it. it was, yeah, I mean, it was, maybe it had some weird undertones, I guess. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. It was still really well shot. It was, those were, those were just really, those were amazing to just to be on set for. And like you spend, much like the Macy's thing, but you spend, you know, two, three days working on a promo that then in the end is 30 seconds. <laughs> but it definitely did, you know, that, that campaign. And that was one of the biggest campaigns that MTV had ever done. I just remember that, that tagline, love be afraid, just felt so it just really kind of resonated and connected and you know it, it's it's what the beauty of the show was it, it was about puberty and hormones it's 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 the the oldest story in the world of just you know your body is changing and you can't control it and how does it relate obviously it, it's it's such a great concept but from a marketing 
perspective, it was so easy to work with and so relatable and everyone was super hot. So <laughs> it helps. It was easy. Yeah. I always love those cool tagline. It's like why it was easy for me to write genre, even though I'd never thought of myself as a genre writer. It was like there's so much that was like Jeff's writing was so metaphorical. Uh, and I, I mean, all genre is metaphorical, but like in Teen Wolf specifically, it was very intentional. And so it was just easy. Like I consider myself a writer who writes about race, religion and politics. But like there was so much space to write about those things while never mentioning those things in a werewolf show. Love Be Afraid. I remember when you guys first pitched that tagline to the writers and producers and we were like, yeah, I don't know about that. And then like <laughs> within two weeks, everybody was like, Love Be Afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Tumblr was such a big thing for Teen Wolf, it seemed like, you know, for fans to be really involved on there. I, this, it just in the realm of like, I can't believe anyone let me do whatever I wanted or whatever, like me and my coworkers wanted to do, but we, MTV didn't have a Tumblr. So Teen Wolf was actually the first Tumblr of any Viacom property. And then we started the MTV Tumblr and it was just the wild west. Like I remember my, <laughs> I remember one of my bosses calling me and like in the inter office, like phone system and being like, okay, like you can't post things with nudity on the Teen Wolf Tumblr. And then I'm like, <laughs> but like, it's this amazing picture of Patty Smith wearing like a wolf head and like one of her breasts is exposed. He was like, I know that's what the audience likes, but like, we're a giant media corporation. I'm like, all right, fine. But like in <laughs> retrospect, like, what, was, what was wrong with me that I thought that that was okay? But it was like, and then I got into so much from Tumblr too, like just kind of being a part of that. I think it was, you know, it makes you crazy uh, in, in a lot of ways. It was at such a weird time. It makes me feel a thousand years old because it's just like, it's like, man, do you even know what it was like back in the Tumblr Wars? Like, we, like, <laughs> we, like I've seen some shit. Uh, <laughs> like with fandom, with, yeah, just the wild west of the internet and being able to kind of post anything you want to. And then just having that be such a weird concept that I don't think that I'm not, I'm, I have no ego. I'm like, I'm like, I don't think I'm that smart. I just th thought it was so crazy that other people weren't exploring this space for TV shows, especially kind of in this genre. So that like, not every show was live gifting like the entire episode from front to back. That's crazy to me. Like, that's what the internet is for. People craved those moments and that interaction. And again, when I say like, did did we did we step in it? Did we put our foot in our mouth sometimes? Like, yeah. But because trying to explore and be creative and and figure out what people wanted to see and react to. But that's and that's what specifically was so fun about season one too, of just like everybody kind of like seeing it for the first time and experiencing those characters and knowing the moments that people were gonna flip out about like so far in advance. It just felt really new and special. It's not my favorite season. I can't decide what my favorite season is, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think it might be four actually. Well, I think it's the, like also a very simple mystery and also funnier. Like Ian Stokes comes and like, he came in 3B, I think. Yeah. Like, yeah. He was really influential in season four and he just likes a good joke. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes he does yeah, season four was funny and it just why well, was i was talking to to karen and joe and, and about some of the questions that you guys had and like and after i watched it was just a couple hours ago after i watched episode after our formality i was saying you know I, I then just rolled right through and watched the finale of season one because i was like damn this show still slaps like yeah. it's, it's good. good but then when season two came on and i remember having the same exact reaction when we got the first cut of the first episode of season two and no shade or offense to anyone who worked on season one. I also did, but like season two starts and you're like, oh damn, it looks like a TV show. Like <laughs> it's just like the production is a lot heavier, like a lot higher in season two. In season two, I mean, season one, I was, I just watched Formality right before we sat down to do this. And I was really looking forward to the theme song and the music. Oh, I mean, yeah. All, oh, right. And I was like, damn it, we didn't have any. I forgot. <laughs> we were supposed to. <laughs> well, y'all didn't like the ones that we liked. So it was a whole thing. Well, I don't think that teenagers in 2011 would like necessarily, well, would like Hungry Like the Wolf as much. Also, we couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now we're getting down to it. Oh, there's a exactly. there's, there's Russell Mulcahy, who I think you guys talked to, has directed yeah. all these Duran Duran videos, and he had a remix of Hungry Like the Wolf Made, and there was an animated credit secret sequence, and that's what we really, really wanted in season one. I hated the animated good <laughs> I would love to see that. Oh my god. Me too. But I remember the music and I speaking of slaps. So what was it like filming in Atlanta versus filming in LA? I know that you said that this was kind of before Atlanta was as much of a filming hub as it is now. So what what was that like, that difference? Yeah, it, it was a little bit like more family for us just because we were able to bring in people who had worked on other shows other movies with us who you know still live in Atlanta and are are working there and then we came out to LA and it's kind of like a new crew but what was fun about it is that everything was under one roof like in Atlanta we did a lot more location work than we ended up doing in LA so it was like the writers, the editors, the shooting, it was everybody was in this one building. And so <laughs> by getting the advantage of being able to see it, see it from the writer's room to Post was such a huge advantage because Post was always in LA. So um, you couldn't just necessarily pop into an editor's bin when, when we worked in Atlanta. But um, yeah, moving to LA was like a very eye-opening experience in terms of just like the industry and what it's like. like Teen Wolf has always been the the scrappy show who gets it done on a budget. You know, we're like, you know, we're not on a studio lot. You know, we're not like seeing stars on the way to work. Like we're in a warehouse in the valley. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade either of them for the world. They were both different, but both great. Awesome. Matt, do you have a favorite fan moment from Teen Wolf? And was it meeting us? First of all, it was definitely meeting us. <laughs> we met at we met at Bicon. We or, first met or... at Days of the Wolf. And I do have to thank you because you introduced me to Angela and Alyssa, who then introduced me to Will being like have you met Will? So while well, they were going, trying to go on to something else. And, you know, crazy friendship. We're still I remember, besties. I, I, I couldn't remember. Days of the Wolf was the one. Oh, yeah. Days it was of creation. The Wolf was like, Entertainment. Was that in Burbank? It was like, uh, yes. Burbank? Supernatural and Teen Wolf, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah. I had gone to a lot of the Supernatural ones beforehand. Yeah. Supernatural yeah. was their big one. But then, yeah, they did some Teen Wolf ones. And that was, and also segue, that was my first Make-A-Wish experience. And uh, every one of oh. those was my favorite um, fan Aww. interaction. It's like very, very corny and sappy, but uh, it was my favorite part of any job that I've ever had in my entire life was doing Make-A-Wish for MTV. And it only happened because of Team Wolf. Like I would never have actually even gotten involved in Make-A-Wish. Someone reached out to me because they couldn't reach anyone at at either Viacom or MGM or whoever, whoever they had talked to before and I was so overwhelmed and like, oh my God, what can I do? And of course I'll, I'll, I'll try to make something happen. And the only thing they weren't shooting at the time. And the, the idea that we had was, well, you know, some of the actors are doing this fan convention, so maybe we can like do that. And I just remember days of the wolf and fan conventions that are not created by fans of which there are many that are also great, but uh, like those are not my favorite thing. It's a really kind of weird for profit industry that, I think ends up taking advantage of fans way more than it does helping them. It's outrageously expensive. You know, you have meet and greets and these photo ops that are five seconds and they don't treat the talent well, but they really don't treat the fans well. But every time we would do one of them, I would get to sneak in some Make-A-Wish things and it was great. They would get to attend and spend time in the green room and do that. And then after that, we started doing it a lot. We had Make-A-Wish kids, I think, One of the last ones I did was a -A Make-A-Wish kid who appeared in an episode. And for the most part, because the Make-A-Wish Foundation is about kids who are going through or have been through something hard, it's not, you know, what you kind of think it is, but we've lost Make-A-Wish kids too. And and some of those have been my my most treasured kind of fan memories. I think the, no, not the last one, but, but one of the most memorable ones was this young, he was, I think, 16, just the biggest Teen Wolf fan that I've ever met probably. And he came to set and I can't remember what the creature was called, but it was our fan creature contest where we let a fan design a monster that would be on the show. 
And we decided to double up. And again, no one said no. Jeff never said no to anything that I would ask in terms of fan engagement. And so we let a make a wish kid actually like wear the suit and be the monster and did a whole video behind him. And that was just the most I've ever cried at work. Uh, just because it was the most like overwhelming and incredible experience. And 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 all of them were. I've always had a an amazing experience with Make a Wish, but beyond that, because that's you know the the a little bit like sappier side. Every fan encounter I've had was great. Just like listening to stories about people and how Teen Wolf changed their lives, and and I never I didn't get it for the longest time about why a show about werewolves would change someone's life. And hearing these stories about mental illness and self harm and body dysmorphia and not being able to connect them, and then kind of realizing in a broader term that Teen Wolf was just about finding yourself and discovering who you are. And that's so important. I wish I had a show like that when I was 13 that I cared about that much that could change my life. So even my negative fan interactions were positive ones. Days of the Wolf in particular actually taught me a lot about fandom as well. Cause I, I meeting you guys, meeting another woman named Kate, whose last name is escaping me, was working on a PhD at the time about fandom. And oh, there cool. was a woman who she said that she'd been suicidal at one point and that she loved Teen Wolf because it introduced her to Derek Hale. And she's like, if Derek Hale had been through everything he'd been through and didn't commit suicide, then she wouldn't either. And oh my God. There was a, another woman who had Be Your Own Anchor tattooed on her oh. arm. Yeah, it was, that was a very eye-opening weekend on a number of levels uh, to, to like really, because up until that point, all my interactions with Teen Wolf fans had been online, which is a, a hellscape. It's very different. <laughs> it's very <Yeah>. different. <laughs> It, it helped me understand a lot and like appreciate it a lot more than I had appreciated it before. The human, the human element of it is so, was so eye opening. I think I also changed my mind about a lot of interactions that I've had online with people, like after meeting them in person. I've met fans that hated me in person. Oh. I've met, I've met people that didn't like, you know, that thought that everyone who worked on Teen Wolf, either in production or at MTV was a, just a fandom hating, queer baiting scum. But like, you know, then you meet people in person and you also realize that they have reasons for being so passionate about representation. And that sounds horrible, <laughs> but like not for being passionate about representation. They have reasons for taking that kind of representation. So, so personally and letting them affect it. I do remember one person and uh, I have a very dear friend that still calls me by what she affectionately called me online, which was Maddie McShittick. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Brandon Freeberg, who used to work with me, still calls me that sometimes because yeah, because you, they, everyone, because people take it personally. And I think that was something that I didn't understand and that took me longer than I would have liked to understand is that people took Teen Wolf, everything that was on the show, everything that I did so personally because it was super personal though I'm like that's cheesy but I think I kind of have a more namaste like I I understand that now I wish that I had realized how personal it was to everyone but I saw also I think you are taking on a little bit more responsibility there than is your due it's because there's so many things that happen around the name of a show around the universe of the show that have nothing to do with each other and so as a fan from the outside you're like teen wolf did this and this and this and this and they all are connected on a three line whereas it's like the writers have no idea that they did that photo shoot somewhere else like that's not that is not even on our radar so like okay so maybe angela and i were talking about one specific moment that the writers had no idea about but yes I agree. There's, multiple. Exactly. there's multiple like come on like even like if you do even a promo shoot like i was friends with you and lou so maybe i was at two Right. Because it would be like, oh, I'm off. It's the middle of the night. Am I going home and going to bed? I'm a little bit wired. Maybe I'll go to the promo shoot. None of the other writers are hanging out at a promo shoot. So right. that could be saying anything. And yeah. we're not going to see it until it starts airing. And at which point the entire season is written and shot. So like people are tying what happens in this promo shoot to what's happening in the show. And they have nothing to do with each other. It's, it's one of those things that also like, 
not and and angela is totally right it's separate from the show but it's part of the larger ecosystem now that the show inhabits because the network has a responsibility and mgm who makes and fox who makes the dvds have a responsibility because they put a bunch of comic books in there that the writers and no one had ever seen before like there were different there were there there's a different kind of ecosystem to the show as a whole the styles and derek on a boat at on um, the tv guide yacht at comic-con was just because i thought it would be cute <laughs> And my friend Amy Pascal actually made me a rubber stamp that I have somewhere like, that I usually can see that says, I thought it would be cute at the time. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Which is my total downfall. You can totally include that. No, the, the, the steric boat incident is, is 100% my fault. Like I, I really did. I thought it would be cute. The TV guide thing is uh, a TV guide used to have a yacht that they would roll out at Comic-Con. Everyone has a couple drinks. They do a photo shoot. They do amazing interviews on it. They wine and dine you. It's awesome. And we were like, oh, maybe we should shoot a little video. It'd be really cute because fans love styles and they love Derek not taking it seriously. It was really cute. I think that a lot of the problem just in general was like Supernatural had been on doing so much queer being at the time. Fans, a lot of, there was a lot of overlap in fans there and they were already so angry at stuff that Supernatural had been doing that I think like, yeah, at that point they were like, oh, we just can't take any more queer beating or something. Yeah, and I think it's, it's the- Blame the, Supernatural. The thing about, the thing about, I mean, yeah, Supernatural, it's a whole different story. <laughs> Uh, this is a, that's a different podcast. Which I'll talk about I have nothing to say about the marketing of that show, that but that was also a big one. same with a lot of not 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 Jeff, not like not a lot of people that I care about, but same with a lot of showrunners too. Like learn what to say and when to say it, and what conversations that you should be a part of. The queer baiting as a, as a, in an an idea is because there isn't enough representation on television in a lot of ways. So even when you have a show like Teen Wolf where there is a lot of representation and it exists in this perfect universe and there's a lot of different kind of queerness within characters that is totally accepted and acceptable, you have that notion kind of that there should be more as a fan. And that's, I think, very true. So I think it's not it's not the show's fault that there's not more representation everywhere in television. I loved as a viewer, as a fan, how much representation that Angela and Jeff and everyone put into the show. But I understand frustration from audiences too, just because there isn't enough in general. Yeah. So queer baiting was a term that I hated because it was so often kind of hurled at at the writers, at Jeff, at me for no reason. Like, uh, and I thought it was Weaponized a little bit. Yeah, like I, but I get it. Like it, it's, it's valid when it's just about... TV and content in general. Matt, did you notice a difference between Teen Wolf fans and fans of other MTV shows, like say Scream? Teen Wolf had fans. Oh, oh, oh I would like to report a murder, please. <laughs> Kidding. Um, Brutal. No. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, after a certain point, I, I started for the first couple of years I worked on just Teen Wolf. I was working on only our scripted kind of priority shows when I was freelance and that was really fun and I was just working on Teen Wolf and Awkward and then after a while and then by the end I was working on on, on heading fan engagement for all of our shows. The difference was is that they they cared more. They were harder to deal with because they would use terms like queer baiting and they would talk about uh, like really deep issues but also it was the most rewarding group of fans to interact with because they cared. Scream didn't have a, I, I was only really really part of Scream season one and, and two, but before it aired. So it didn't really find its kind of footing and fan base. And I think without even specifically talking about Scream, which had a lot of talented people who directed that show and wrote on that show, but a lot of other shows, they just didn't, it didn't find the same kind of audience. It didn't resonate the same. I just listened to an interview with Rose Damo, who works for Netflix, who I think is just such an amazing online presence. And she was on the podcast, Las Culturistas, talking about the first time that she experienced culture was uh, in terms of fan fiction and realizing you can create that the, the show and the characters mean something so deeply to you that you can take them and change them and create whatever you want, even if you don't agree with where the show is going. And that's what I saw in Teen Wolf that I didn't really see anywhere else. That's part of what I mean when I say the worlds are so different from content creation to fandom, because I feel like a lot, in particular on Teen Wolf, people rewatch 
people rewatch and they look for messages and they they look for the they're looking for the subtleties that may or may not have intentionally landed. Like we know we've all been in eighth grade literature class, so we have to read between the lines and find. The, <laughs> and I think people are looking for things and finding things that may or may not ever have intentionally been planted. Whereas on our side, we write it, we shoot it. There are scenes that didn't that exist that were didn't make it into the final cut there are scenes that you know were were trimmed and lines that never actually landed on the show and so then what everyone is accepting as canon we have a completely different version of what Mm -hmm. actually happened to get us to this point and also we've moved on so it's like once the script is out we're on to the next episode. So we're not going to re-watch it. We're not going to re-examine it under such the magnifying glass and the, yeah. or the microscope that fandom does and engages in the, in the material that we created in a very different way right. than we ever did. Right. That's definitely something I, I feel like a lot of fans and people who, or people who just watch television and movies and all that, that Angela, you're absolutely correct that it's like, they have all the time in the world to ingest the the final product. But it's like when we were doing it, we had weeks to deal with like one story with one episode. And by the time it was finally, you know, hot off the press and given to production to actually film, we're well into breaking the next episode so that we're just moving so fast because the train is right behind us because, you know, that's how production is that you're always behind. Even before you start writing the season, you're already late. And, and that it's just, you know, when you, you know, when the viewer sees something in a scene or a line of dialogue, it's like, we've, we are so far beyond that scene and that line of dialogue that, you know, we honestly probably don't even remember writing it at the, to be completely honest, you know, so. Yeah, there, there's, there's definitely just, if you're not familiar with how the process works, it's, yeah, I think a lot of those sort of fan readings of things, it it comes from like a misunderstanding of thinking that making a show is like writing a novel, you right. know, where you're or you have time to like comb over the subtleties of word choice and the nuances of the characters. And the reality is that television is so much more tangled in its own commercial requirements that it just doesn't work out that way most of the time. Well, even just the collaboration of it, right? So like the tone of voice that an actor chose to deliver that line is different than the tone of voice that you heard when you wrote it. And it, and which take did the editor choose to put in the show? Right. Of how they deliver that line. And so then when we're, when you were engaging as a fan, I'm like, well, she said it like that. You're like, well, there were four different versions of that line. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The editor just liked that one. So (laughs) there's, yeah, there's a lot that happens to get to, to get from where you've created it to where we're watching repeatedly. And then ultimately then the fan, then the fans own it. Like that. Yeah. Good. And then it's your, I mean, like, yeah, take it, right. write your fan fiction, yeah. but don't like attack the writer when they didn't see it the way that you saw it. Yes. Are there any current projects that you guys are working on that you'd like to talk about? I'm still working with Angela on different projects and I'm really excited to kind of just keep creating with the people that I met and love on Teen Wolf. I work on documentary work now and projects. I took a, I took a sharp left after MTV. <laughs> And, and to to work in news, still being a huge fanboy, but I needed to leave the reality TV machine, and you know, and MTV stopped doing scripted work. So yeah, and I, I'll just you know, there's nothing that like I'm at liberty to like really talk about, but based on what Matt just said about Teen Will, I'll just shout out Jeff because like he specifically and intentionally wanted to help people get to what they wanted to do, like. I wanted to be a writer. He made me a writer. Like Alyssa was an editor who wanted to write. She came in, you know, she started writing. There were a number of people who were on the production side who wanted to direct and they directed their first episodes of Teen Will. Like there were a lot of actors who had nothing on their resumes. And, you know, that's a whole other, that was my first fan engagement when they were like, all they do is kill women and people of color on that show. And I would be like, no, those are actors who have no other job and they get their, they got their first credit on Dean Will. So like, I, I I understand the optics, but also the show was just, he used it as a ladder and yeah, paid it forward. And I, I love that about Dean Will. Jeff, shout out Jeff. Jeff got me involved in production. I wasn't in a production role. I was doing Twitter and Facebook and, but I was always holding a camera and doing something and he was just like, well, why don't you just start making things? And 
and ended up turning that into a new job. Like he, he was never my boss. He never directly paid me, but yeah, he, he definitely helps me. Awesome. And that is awesome. Yeah. Maybe I guess final question. If y'all had to choose one episode of the entire series as your favorite, what would it be? I, I have to keep thinking about which one is my favorite, but I would say I still have that screen grab written by Angela Harvey, season three, episode five, which is my very oh. favorite episode of TV. Prayed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I was going to say, like, from a pure memory perspective, like, knowing that the first episode Angela wrote was season three, episode five, that had her, that had her name on it, and also that entire experience. There was a fan who was in a scene on that show. We were in the desert. I'm a New York boy, so I got ridiculously sunburned in February <laughs> because I didn't understand how climates work. Like that entire experience. And also that's such a great episode. Just like the the bus, the tension, the desert, the highway. Uh, the mall. The mall that we shot in the event. The mall. It turns up in the Beyonce visual album. Like, yeah. I lost my mind. I was like, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Because that also has Max and Charlie, like, appearing and then, like, double flipping over the balcony of the mall. Yeah. That's my favorite episode of the Teen Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> I think, actually, actually having this conversation was very helpful because that does that was an amazing experience. But the very next episode, Motel California, season three, episode six, Oh my god, oh, yeah. Right. So good. It's good. Tyler Posey, I was on set when they did the You're My Brother scene. Yeah. Yeah, That's there's really so good. many. I mean, also like this doing this podcast has now made me think that I'm probably going to be rewatching Teen Wolf for the next few weeks, so like I'll I'll probably have a more definitive answer, but you can call in. On I'll call I'll call, I'll call in. I'll be yeah, like actually love- yeah, if you guys are willing, totally would love to talk to you again. And Angela, we would love to talk to you for the first episode. For Frank, that would be awesome. That would be so amazing if you're filled up to it. We had a great time talking to Matt and Angela, and we hope to get them back onto the podcast soon. But now, let's jump back into the main episode with some spoiler talk with Ashby. This is the first time where I think we might, at least I, as I was paying attention to it, that we might get the sense that Lydia isn't who she seems that that there's more to Lydia than maybe meets the eye and I don't know if I'm like making it up and it's just a coincidence and the writers had no clue the direction that Lydia was going to go as far as the whole banshee thing in season one but she seems to know at the exact moment that Jackson is coming up against the hunters in the woods that she needs to be with Jackson like she feels that she needs to find him that she needs to go to him and it almost seems like ESP precognition like whatever sort of banshee thing that she has going on in later episodes and later series it's like is is this is this like a little hint hint nudge nudge or is it a coincidence i can't say because i wasn't there i don't know when jeff and the writers decided that lydia was going to be a banshee I know that they knew she was going to get bitten, but they didn't know what was going to happen because that was something Jeff wanted to play with in season two because that's how you get Jackson is the canima is he's bitten by a werewolf and they say that the shape you take reflects the person you are. So I don't know when they exactly decided that Lydia would be a banshee. I feel like it might just be a coincidence. I think this is just one of the situations where they knew that Lydia was going to get bitten like Jackson and we're going to, it's going to be a surprise what it turns out to be. Because it definitely, you know, with Jackson, that opens the door of, well, just because you're bitten doesn't mean you become a werewolf automatically. And then I think it was, they just kind of held back on Lydia because she had, she goes through such, such an intense story in season two because of Peter's sort of fail safe device in her brain that I feel like they were just waiting for the right moment to figure out exactly, they were letting, they were waiting for the story to dictate what she needed to be. They were going to, the story was going to find itself. And that when they were breaking whichever episode it is, I don't remember which one where they finally realized, oh, she's a banshee. That that's what it's going to be. I think they just kind of let the story unravel naturally and they let the the right supernatural creature come to come to her. That's a perceptive thought though i it it had never occurred to me that 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 it does seem very aptly timed that he's in walking into mortal danger when she says that yeah that's what i love about rewatches you get to notice things because you're not watching it for the first time as someone who's just waiting for the next thing to happen and so you can sort of start seeing like little intricacies and sometimes it really is a coincidence but it's always like fun 
to, I feel like Harry Potter primed me to be the kind of person that's like, everything matters. Everything means something because Rowling has so many intricacies. And so now when I watch things, sometimes I'm just like, what if, like, I feel like the the guy with the board, I'm like, what if they had already decided that she would, and then like, she's like, actually just like, she senses that Jackson's in danger. And so like, this is a whole thing. And like, they knew in season one and that's not it at all. (laughs) (laughs) Where's Pepe Sylvia? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So my other thing was, Styles. So Styles is trying to save Lydia's life, and Peter wants information. And Styles lies and says he doesn't know where Derek is. And then, of course, Peter says, "I can tell that you're lying." And then Styles has this whole revelation suddenly that he's thought through about how Scott lost his phone, but he doesn't think Scott lost it. He thinks Derek took it so that they could track the GPS and they could find Derek. And my thought was like, "Wait a second, how long is?" Styles been sitting on this thought like is he having this adrenaline rush under pressure and he suddenly realizes something and puts the pieces together in that moment and like his brain just sort of like rises to the occasion or has he known since he watched Scott rifle around for his phone that they could have just GPS tracked Derek's location at any time and Styles could really just sort of like care less about what's happening to Derek. And it's, you know, is, is all this sort of like joke that Styles has been making about letting Derek die, maybe just a little serious. Like maybe Styles has made sort of a morally ambiguous decision not to save Derek, even though he has the ability to. And if that's true, then I feel like this is the first time that we see Styles really make a decision that maybe isn't the most heroic decision and isn't the decision that Scott would make. And then we see Styles realize that and withhold information from Scott. And we know that this is going to become a theme and it's going to become a problem that Styles is often the one who has his hands elbow deep in the dirt that is Scott's moral compass and the situations that it gets them into. And Styles has to be the one in the friendship to make the tough decisions and to maybe wade into the gray area that Scott's not willing to. And I just thought it was really interesting that we see that. And I'm making a lot of background leaps, but it is true that Styles has a solution t- for Peter about how to find Derek. And we just have to decide whether or not Styles has been withholding this information the whole time or whether he comes up with a solution on hand and what that means for his character <laughs> in this moment. Great observation. And yeah, something that, like you said, like whenever I was originally watching the show, it didn't stand out to me. It doesn't seem like something he comes up with in the moment. It sounds to me like something he's already thought of. Yeah. Why didn't he already say something to Scott about it? Look, Styles is my favorite character. This is not any kind of like bashing. I think that Styles has a lot of reasons for the things that he does. And I think that Styles sometimes finds himself being the person that has to make the difficult decisions that Scott won't. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really interesting that we see it this early on when I feel like it doesn't really become a fracture in their relationship until season five. What an ominous way to end the episode, Ashby. Though I do look forward to all the sparks and drama between Scott and Styles in season five. Calissa, you want to take us out? That concludes this week's episode of Return to Beacon Hills. Thank you again, Ashby, for joining us. Would you like to go ahead and remind everyone where they can find What the What, which they should definitely check out? Yeah, absolutely. You can find What the What most places that you get your podcast. And we are WTW underscore media on Twitter. And we're at What the What media, all one word on Instagram. And just as a reminder, we're just sort of a general pop culture podcast. We sort of cover it from the perspective of being an 80s, 90s baby. So there's a lot of really fun episodes and you can pick and choose the ones you want to listen to. We're in the middle of a big MCU series run talking about all of the MCU movies. So we'd love to have you come listen to us. And then just in a, a general sense, if you want to follow me and my life and my animals and my pop culture, you know, things that I love, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashby Gray, G-R-A-Y. I've seen pictures of your dog on there and he is very adorable. Thank you. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at RTBH Podcast and Tumblr and TikTok at Return to Beacon Hills. 
If you'd like to ask us questions or offer suggestions for future topics to discuss, you can email us at returntobeaconhills at gmail.com. Join us here next week when we discuss Season 1, Episode 12, Codebreaker, and sit down with Jeff Davis, creator and showrunner of Teen Wolf. Rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast goodness. Five-star reviews get a shout-out. Have a great week, and we'll see you again soon on Return to Beacon Hills. Dude, it's Beacon Hills.